I'm Avery. And I'm Mel. This is the Veda Lounge Podcast. All things Vedic, cosmic, and magic. For yoga teachers, entrepreneurs, creatives, and coming back to your own center. We explore themes on living like you practice to knowing your nature. Join the conversation for an embodied homecoming to illuminate your radiance. Through getting nerdy with Vedic sciences and self-discovery, cozy into your cosmic cadence. Hello, welcome back to the Veda Lounge podcast. It's Mel here. And Avery, happy, oh my gosh, I don't even know what day it is. I've been traveling, so I don't know where I'm at or what time it is. I feel like the days are blurring though right now. It's just been a weird, it's been a weird week. It's summertime. It's summer. Wait, and you just got, you're now in California, right? Yeah, after a lovely 24 hours of of travel. (laughs) I was texting you yesterday, for whatever reason recently, stuff with travel has just, I've had to be really open to the fact that it's just not going to go. Like even when I left Sedona, when you and I left Sedona, flights were wild. So it took me like 24 hours to get here, but I'm here. I made it. So. It's like, I always have to reframe that maybe there's like some type of protection or something on the why, but I will say I'm a snob. I am a straight flight, like no, mm. like I do not do stops or I will, I will just not like, I have to go from point A to point B. And if they don't have a straight flight there, I'm probably driving. So, oh my gosh, it's so hard. It used to be really easy, um, to get cross country flights into San Diego. My family is all based in San Diego. So I come out a few times a year, but it's been so difficult, um, to find those straight shot flights. So, yeah. It was me in Dallas last night, sleeping in a <laughs> in a gate. Wait, do you really stay? I've never knock on wood had that happen. You you stay yeah. In so what's wild is I was leaving Nashville and my flight out of Nashville kept getting pushed back and back and back, and. I ended up making it to Dallas, but missed my connecting flight. And it was so late at night that they were like, we, there's, there are no other flights out tonight. We'll get you on a flight 6 a.m. Okay, great. And the funny thing too, is it would have been really easy to get real sour and real upset about it. Um, but again, knowing, right. Just me being like, I'm going to let whatever happened happens. I met the most incredible human beings along my journey, just like people. And I think people often have a real negativity and a real sour spot. And it's really hard to please travelers. Um, but I just got so, and even though things didn't work out, so to speak, I met some lovely humans. So I spent my night last night, like on the American Airlines website, just like shouting these people out, I'll be like, please give him a raise, give him extra vacation days. <laughs> I think in travel you see the best and the worst of people but truly Mm. I mean a lot of times and this is why being responsible for the framework of how we're receiving experiences because especially when things are out of our control it's like we either suffer in the waiting room or we look at it as preparation for the future right and we can be in a different place with it because Oh. And it, that's too, right? It's just not being attached to it's going to go this way. And I think travel is a really great, great metaphor for that because you you just don't really ever know. Um, so it's a kind of a let go and let God type of situation. That's my motto when it comes to traveling. <laughs> well, it makes me think of too of how we can use these different external experiences to train that coherence and to train mm. that self inquiry. And I'm a big one on how to make it cozy, right? Like how can I make this really yummy or to reframe that if I miss this or this doesn't, you know, but like I said, I'm a total self-care snob around, I'm either driving and having the most magical like cross country road trip or my flight situation is going to be as like clean and simple. I do like right away in the morning to try to prevent the flights getting affected in the afternoon and you know, I think these things through because I don't, many people know this about me. I hate flying on airplanes. So do you really? Yes. I'm already so Vata. Are you kidding me? Put me in the sky. I I don't even know where my skin is anymore. I'm like, Oh, Oh, I feel that. I can see that. 
I literally have a playlist though that I listen to and it's um it's so good but it's like all these like binaural beats and affirmations and right when we get on the plane I will put the headphones in I usually have a Dolores Cannon book that I'm gonna read because uh, reading about regressions and fascinating things in history and I just check out and go into a whole different dimension and I'm like in the sky vibing reading Dolores Cannon so I've learned how to make it yummy for myself essential oils I have like all these layers because I like to cuddle up and and I always get a window seat so I can like you know, take See, and so the, the funny thing about yesterday is because that's ideal, right? That's ideal for me. And it was like yesterday, at, right? I was thrown on whatever flight I could get. So I inevitably end up in a middle seat and I'm like exhausted from traveling all day. I'm right. Not comfortable in my body because I'm jammed. And so it's like in those moments where like, I, I think about my yoga practice and how that has prompted me and primed me to be in those uncomfortable moments because there's truly <laughs> nothing more uncomfortable than being smashed in a middle seat of an airplane for hours the middle of the night you're exhausted and if you're like me you also can't fall asleep on air <laughs> airplanes so what do you do truly and for me it was like I sat there and I just was breathing I was connected to my breath for as long as I could be because I was like that's right anchoring me into my space because otherwise this is right this is not not pleasant um but yoga has really done that for me and helped me to go okay what am I feeling and how do I bring myself out of that or how do I at least pacify it a little bit yeah. and they're doing I'm in there <laughs> doing repetitive breath movement and the girls next to me are probably like what in the world is she doing well, it gets us out of the head and in the body. And, you know, one thing that I know Avery and I were wanting to bring to you guys today is to talk a little bit about yoga sutras and disarming the fear and discomfort around the yoga sutras. And I, I want to share that, you know, in my 200 hour, when I first was becoming a yoga teacher, we referenced it. We learned about, you know, the eight limbs of yoga or the yamas and niyamas and some of these different concepts, but I really didn't fully immerse in it. I don't even remember diving into it in my 300 hour that I took. And it's really been this thing that I, I believe can be used in the yoga industry or in these paths of a way to almost make us feel inadequate because we're like, oh, I don't have this memorized or I don't, you know, I don't, I struggle with reading it but when it's really not necessarily something that's meant to be a cover to cover, read it once, let it go. I've really learned to collaborate with it as almost like affirmation cards where you flip to a random one and you check in. And so Avery and I are going to play a little bit today and share with you guys some ways to deepen into this Vedic science because when we look at these concepts, it's funny we're talking about travel and we're talking about reframe because the yoga sutras and just yoga philosophy in general really gives us an infrastructure to renegotiate our experiences with, right? And so I want to open up the floor with you, Avery, and just sh if you want to share, you know, your journey with this topic and even why we're, we're talking about this. Yeah, so much like you, um, going through 200-hour yoga teacher training, right? It's on every reading list. Um, if it's not on a school's reading list, I would be shocked. But I had no idea, right, coming in and being so fresh and new, bought every book off the list, was, you know, reading, going in order, picked up the Yoga Sutras, opened it like I was about to read it front to back because I had no idea what I was in for. And immediately I was terrified. And I think I, I like skidded through book one, two, three, four. And I was like, for another day, right? Because it, it can look scary. It's, and I think it's because we don't, A, a lot of us are not prefaced on what is this? So you pick up this book, right? That has ancient wisdom and knowledge, a lot of Sanskrit, and you're meant to make something of it. And that can look like you have a mountain to climb. And so I think what we can, what we immediately do is go, oh, oh, all right, I'll come back to that one. And I think the reality is a lot of students don't. Yeah. Oh, for because sure. Because their first experience with it is, 
Well, and what you just said is context, right? Like, what is the context? And if we zoom mm -hmm. out, you know, this is something that comes mostly from the Samkhya Yoga school of thought. And we in the Western, our Western culture, because there's a lot of different I guess classical texts, right? Like I'm a Bhagavad Gita crazy. Like I love that book and that's because I'm a poet. So when I first picked that up, I'm like, ooh, this is like romantic. Like I love the way it flows where I meet a lot of people who are like, I am so confused. But when we look at these books, understanding context and getting curious about that it's not this program that we've been trained on in the West that I need to read to memorize to pass something or to prove myself but it's really a mirror for self-study and there's all these little gems and it doesn't have to be in this order but rather it collaborates with our journey and our practice right well and I think what happens is we pick it up and we're so programmed to read to understand right to read to solidify the knowledge but the reality was something like the sutras is that it's not always about the analytical um translation so to speak it's more about the relationship that we have with the sutras because the the entire purpose is to embody them right and so as we begin to embody and put these things into practice it's natural that our relationship with them changes over time right and we deepen into what something means or we pull back and say well maybe this doesn't actually mean that because it feels more like this in my life it's the, I think our bias is too with life experience like in different seasons, things relate in different ways because oh, absolutely. I, I know uh, before we got on, we were talking about the, like a sutra or just, you know, we were talking about this before we started recording this episode and Avery brought up a sutra that she had connected with. And we were talking about duality, which I feel is one of the, everybody goes, oh yeah, duality, yoga, hatha, right? Ha, sun, tha, moon, nervous system, parasympathetic, uh, sympathetic. There's all these duality in yoga, but yet we really struggle with understanding what that is and, it, and reconciling duality. And I love that that was what you brought up because the sutras really show us yeah, just for it. Yeah. So when when Mel initially brought this idea and was like, oh, let's dive into the sutras and let's just see if we can make it something that's a little bite sized and easily digestible and, and maybe unscare some people, right? Maybe inspire people to dive in and find one, right? Uh, and I was like, oh, Mel, <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> like, but so then I was like, I right under the guise of reframe I'm like well this gives me the opportunity right this gives me the opportunity to go in to find something and so in passing I found a sutra that's actually a very very popular one you hear it a lot I think in yoga classes um and it's chapter two sutra 46 right and it's sutra sukham asanam and the literal translation, I think Patanjali translates that as the physical postures should be both sturdy, steady, and comfortable. And so what he's speaking to very literally is the balance of a posture, right? Saying that to get into meditation, we need this balance of effort and ease. And I thought that that was so beautiful because we talk a lot about how our yoga practice on the mat mirrors just how we move through our day-to-day -day life and it truly is right we're always whether or not we know it striving for balance and harmony and so I think in that sutra it speaks to yes on the mat right yes we need we need balance to create posture to get into the body to translate through the mind but also in our day-to-day -day life right how do we embody that harmony. And I think Mel said it perfectly, right? When it's like, well, we embrace the duality of life. Yeah. We honor, right? That the pendulum is constantly swinging side to side. And a pen, I mean, as you know, right? It's never, it's always going to swing back. In, in yoga philosophy, right? Because you got the Purusha and Prakriti, right? Energy and matter. We see <laughs> these contrasts all the time throughout not just the philosophy and practices, but our lives. And I think if you pull in Eastern philosophy, 
One thing that's very different between Eastern and Western, and we see this in Joytish versus Western astrology, is you know, Eastern is very confronting around acknowledging suffering, taking responsibility, discipline, and presence, right? Where in the West, we're very much of like, what's our goals? How do we get happiness? How do we avoid pain? And when we're applying Eastern philosophies into our Western lifestyle, it can almost feel countercultural or wait, isn't that focusing on the bad, but rather it's that we're through the opposite, we come to know what's true, right? Like you really don't know who you are until you experience who you're not. And it's in those moments, even on the mat, because the mat is such a metaphor, like when she's talking about ease and effort, it's that relaxed effort, using will to soften, right? It's, it's building both. Because if we go, 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 and I think this is part of like the weirdness of our world right now, <laughs> not to bring like weird stuff up, but we're, I want to just, <laughs> I feel like I want to go there. Um, when we look at how wonky, for example, I was talking with someone recently about the hamster wheel of the fitness industry. It's like, you're never enough, right? Like we're always like trying to get bigger, trying to get stronger, trying to like, it's just this constant or with the, with dietitians and the food industry it's like there's always this new diet new information this is the best and it's like we're always in this place of trying to go upward but really we're spiraling in a way versus finding that balance that comes through our own inner awareness and through our awareness we begin to foster that liberation because we see our choices versus being so on one side versus the other so we have to have that wiggle room to learn how to find balance in the first place. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you speak to the awareness of it, that's a huge thing because I don't think that we're taught. I don't think that we learn um, how to identify. Yeah. No, well, we're right. like we, wrong. We right? like, you're like wrong or you're not. Okay. Right. Uh, this is so funny. So, because this is just so perfect. So I went to the gym for the first time in like years with my husband today. And this is- Go you. I Go you. Fitness, Lululemon person. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> so I don't weight train. I don't like, like, I just don't. And I'm sorry for everybody who's so good. I know a lot of you guys do and you're amazing and I admire you. Um, but I just, I don't, I've never been into it. But for some reason today, I'm like, you know what? I want to, like, maybe it's good for vata, right? Weight training is very good for uh, pacifying vata and grounding. And so, you know, I go, I'm like, in my workout, I'm actually like in my workout clothes right now. So I go and I start doing like, you know, he does his reps and then it's my turn. And I'm like, what's the, like, what are we, you know, what is this? <laughs> like, I'm getting bored, right? And I'm like, you know, and then every, it's just like, well, can you do more? Can you do more? And I'm laughing and I'm, I'm bringing this up too, because when we talk about just that permission to make it ours and be in that inquiry of both, where I feel like, well, you know, bring your elbow in, do it this way, do it that way. As a manifester in human design, I'm like, no, I like my elbow out. Like I feel it. And then I was just like, I'm done. So, or I was very kindly like, you know what? I'm going to go and just walk around and so while he's working out, I find that there's like a hair salon there. And I actually was like, do you guys have massages, anything like that? And they're like, <laughs> oh, that is so you. Oh my God, you would. <laughs> they were booked for the evening. I was like, oh, well, that's great. So I ended up getting my daughter her bangs done while he was, because I pulled her out of the kids like fitness thing. And I get her hair done and I'm like, oh, he's still working out. What am I going to go do? So <laughs> take her back and I'm up there. But it's almost like there's this, when we talk about duality, right? Because even though I think it could be easy for me to feel inadequate because I don't, I just, I don't truly enjoy those environments and all the people around it actually like it's hard for me to focus, not because I care what people are seeing of me. It's more, I if I'm really honest, I don't want to share and I don't. It's a lot of energy too. It's, it's a lot, lot going on. It's, it's a much. lot. Yeah. So again, hats off to everybody who's resilient and, or is into that. I think that's the pitta. Like my vata goes, oh my gosh. Right. The pittas are like, I'm on a, on a cadence. But when we look at like how we are participating with our bodies, right. And that duality of, yeah, we want to progress, but do we honor where we're at in the moment? 
And I think that the, when you get to the root of the sutras and a lot of what it's teaching, not just what is yoga, not, not just what is the mind, but also, I mean, book four is a lot about how to resolve suffering. When we look at these, it's all about awareness and that what awareness gives us. And I just think of how headless we can be sometimes with doing it right. Or your uh, quirky me running around a gym, like awkwardly, like, what can I do? Oh, I'll get a protein shake, but I don't like protein. So they're like, what? I hate I protein. I'm not. Yeah. And that's not my jam. It's interesting, like your perspective on it. And cause it's not something that you enjoy. So like I'll share it's been something that I have gravitated to recently, which is weightlifting, but it's because for me, it actually honors my duality because I find strength there. And in my yoga practice, I find a lot of softness. Mm, I love that. And so for somebody like myself, who why I, I love being on my yoga mat, I absolutely, my practice is very soft. Right? I'm not like this rigid yoga practitioner but my body craves that sometime, right? I always have this little bit of pitta that's like waves up in me where I'm like, I, right? And so for me, it feels really good. I feel really strong. I feel really powerful. Um, and so for that's, you know, and maybe that's the perspective. Maybe next time you go in there, Mel, you just have yourself up and be like, I'm, you're, you're already powerful. I'm so good. I'm just going to go. I think it's also seasons and chapters, but mm. I love that you point that out because, you know, with it, this stuff is not just tied to the Austin as we do or the on the mat stuff because you can bring your practice. And as goofy as I was earlier, like walking around and just like letting my husband do what he's doing. Um, it was because I was being honest with myself because I was doing it and I was like, I'm really not, I, I want to, what I want to do is like do a plank and hold it and do crazy stuff. But then I'm like, well, there's so many people here. Where am I going to do that? And then I just don't, you know, I'm like, oh, I'd rather be in my home studio and like do push ups or handstands and, you know, my fit fighter yoga. I do love my fit fighter steel hose, right? Wow. <laughs> so, you know, finding those things that really work for us because. I think that if I didn't have that compassion, there is a part of me that's like, what's wrong with me for not, you know, being in like why it doesn't resonate. Right. And so, but just because it doesn't resonate, doesn't mean we're bad at it. You know, even with the sutras, just because if that doesn't resonate, doesn't mean you're a bad yogi or you're bad at it. It's, I think there's also cycles and seasons that are appropriate for us to deepen into different things too. Right. And I mean, the awareness though, for you to, to be able to be in the middle of something and especially in an environment like that, to check in and say, yeah, this is not for me right now. And then to honor it and to be like, well, now I'm just going to go and do whatever else. Because I think that's, that's the beautiful thing that the awareness of our body and our mind gives us, right. Is then the ability to go and choose differently in a way that truly honors you to not power through something that doesn't feel good, that doesn't feel genuine or authentic, which I think, you know, when we talk about the hamster wheel, that gets us there, right? It's, it's not that we enjoy this run, so to speak, that we enjoy going in circles and getting nowhere. It's that we've been so programmed into just continuing and to just get better and better and more and more and higher and higher. And I think we lose ourselves in that a little bit, right? I think it's why we, we see a lot of the yoga that we see a lot of the fitness industry that we see. It's just because we're all on we're that not, cycle. We haven't really give, been given the options, I feel like. Like, it's very rare to see other ways. I, and, you know, one thing that I read earlier, because um, something I'm doing for self-care right now is I actually created this jar and on the jar, or I was using index cards and putting like affirmations, just things that will mentally support me and nourish me because I've just been in such a wild season. And so I can pull one out of the jar. But one of my favorites is that if the path is clear, you're on someone else's path. Ooh. Right? Like if the path is clear, you're walking someone else's path. Someone's already done this. So, you know, and then another one was like, no is just because it hasn't been done before. So, you know, and, and literally I actually have my, my jar right here. Look at this. 
I made today. It's a reminder jar, and then we just pull it. Let's see what this one says. Let's see. What, what's the message for you guys? Say no to anything that is not interesting. Okay, what? <laughs> After our conversation, if it's not interesting, say no. Uh, let's do one more. That was. These are just reminders for myself. Let's see. Oh, you've done it once. You can do it again and different. Let's do one more. Okay, last one, I promise. Just maybe someone needs to hear it. <gasps> Here it is. If the path, If the path is clear, it means you're walking someone else's. That's so weird out of all, look at this, you guys, there's, this is full. And I just, there was the third one I grabbed was the one. There's I at least like 50 in there. I'm like, I'm like. Oh, I love, that is such a fantastic idea though. So, I mean, share with everyone, because I think that that's something so sweet and. It says oh reminder gosh. jar. So I would call this, this is my reminder jar. And so if I'm feeling like funky in my head or feeling overwhelmed, I just pull one and like today, honestly, it was so, it was perfect because, um, you know, I, today I actually didn't have like a day booked with clients. So I was like, there's part of me that was kind of bullying myself and my mind to work and like figure things out and just be in that energy. But then there's part of me that just wanted to be with my kiddo, watch SpongeBob, sit outside, like, and just be simple. So I pulled one. And it was find your cozy, make it cozy. And I was like, well, there you go. You know, I'm going to eat pasta in the middle of the day today. We're going to watch SpongeBob. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to, me and my kid are going to, so I, my kid has been oh, in California for a couple of weeks. So she's really into crafts and doing stuff. So I'm like, maybe we'll, we'll do that. Cause that's such a sweet idea. I actually love that. It helps. I think because especially when we're in it and for me, I, I journal a lot. And I like to do a lot of inquiry, but when it's in my notebook, I feel almost disconnected from it. Like I got to find it where something like this, you can just draw it. Well, and this is so such a sweet idea because it's your words. It's your writing. Sometimes I think when we like pick up affirmational stuff and it's like, you are enough. You, and it, it doesn't feel like us. So it can feel kind of foreign sometimes to pick up on stuff like that, where we're like, okay, listening to these affirmations, but all good and great but I think sometimes it just doesn't hit because it can feel not like us so I love that it's right quite literally your own handwriting but it's also like a reminder from you to you it is it's my reminder jar so just things I wish I knew right like things I want to remember that are just affirmation based or just inspiring like the example of the first one I drew was, if it's not interesting to you, say no, because I will, I can say yes to a lot of things, and then it's a great idea, but it doesn't light me up, so it's just little reminders. How cool would it be to do something like that with the Yoga Sutras, too, though, right? Like, to, to take your Yoga Sutras, and I really look at the way, and this just has been what works for me with a lot of things, is when I put a lot of pressure to absorb everything and over intellectualize and over rationalize, I actually lose the heart connection of it. So I really love to look at ways to participate, whether it's my meditation, the yoga, the philosophy, just even self care. How can I participate with it throughout my day and find ways to make it really simple because that is good enough. That's beyond good enough. All these rules, again, that's so Western. It's so our culture to, and then what's at the top? I always think of the Drake lyric, you know, like it's lonely at the top. Do you want to be lonely at the top? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I want to be lonely, right? Oh, I'm not tracking. It's fine. <laughs> we did, we did the astrology in class. <laughs> it was, Oh my gosh. What, what class was that? We did, it was recently with one of our classes with, um, we were trying to look at examples and someone was like, what if we looked at Drake's chart? I was like, I'm there. Let's go. Let's look it up. Who told you this? See, I will, I am willing in class, like when things are going on and one of the students are like, Hey, I'll look at this. I'm like, all right, let's pull it up. Let's see. And then like play with it. It's so crazy. It's so it fun. It's so fun. Last week in class, the classes have been so fun for anyone listening, by the way, if you, if you're in like YTT and you want to drop into a beta class, I like as an elective, I, I don't totally would do it. They're so fun. But I was talking about, um, just very briefly, we were like, well, when we look at a Zodiac, like let's, let's, um, right. If the planets are 
actors, right? If we want to personify them, I'm like, let's make the Zodiacs places. And I'm like, what would Gemini? I'm like, Gemini is a circus for sure. Everything is moving cogs. Everything's working in order, but it's chaos. Like we just, but organized chaos. And then so I have, all students are like, well, what is this? What is this? What, right. And we're coming up with all these things. And I'm like, y'all, we're getting wild. We need we need to reel it in but it was so fun so I love that y'all are doing that too well I think it's about relating like when I was just saying how can I participate with this how do we Mm. make it practical and realistic and it's any of these philosophies or the archetypes or you know if you're learning joy tish right the different planets everything whether you personify it or you find ways to practically connect it to something now it's alive now it's vital now it's digestible And so I think it's one of the best ways to learn, you know? Oh, absolutely. It takes it, it turns it into a tangible thing when we make it. So I like how you were talking about, you know, when I'm so rigid and put so much pressure, it becomes very mechanical. And it almost like, I mean, the sutras are a perfect example of that, where it can kind of suck us out of it because it's so, it's so pressure filled. It doesn't feel good. We're like, I need to learn to digest, to understand but I love that you said even like making a jar with some sutras, right? Or p- flicking through and landing on a random page and just going, what does this mean today? Right. And just letting it sit in your body for a second. Exactly. Because the sutras themselves, so sutras mean thread, right? Like, so they're threading this wisdom, the yogic wisdom. And they are so truly beautiful when you actually break down the Sanskrit and what the, what it's telling, right? Because English is such a limited language as far as expression goes, where Sanskrit, it's like very much there's a metaphor or some type of embodiment, but there's also the root of the word. I mean, there's so much, if you get into the Vedic scholar stuff, it's mind blowing how beautiful that stuff is. But if you don't actually understand what it's saying, the whole purpose of communication is to have relayed and shared meaning. So when you sit down and you read what it, what it means, you can connect with the commentary, But if you give yourself permission, because this is where I think a lot of people, they don't do this. Give yourself permission to ask, what does this mean to me? Without being right, without being over intellectual, like what does this mean to me? And how do I connect with it? And if it doesn't resonate, don't make yourself wrong, right? There's, I think what, 197 verses? I'd have to look to double check. Right, it's like, if it doesn't doesn't resonate, move on. But I love that you speak to that because that's kind of what I was saying is, it becomes less and less about the literal translation, which is that mechanical aspect that I think a lot of us get really stuck on. And it becomes our relationship, right, to the actual sutra. So. Well, this is why yoga is an ever evolving relationship with yourself. It's ever evolving. You don't just learn and then it's done, right? It's this continuous journey of learning how to befriend yourself in these different chapters and the wisdom, the concepts, some of them will be really loud at different times in your life. And some of them, I mean, I think about my own life. I'm sure there are so many textures of this stuff that I haven't even tasted yet because I haven't had the life experience to position me to deepen into that yet. And I can trust the timing. I don't have to know it all yet, but what do I need to know right now to nourish my soul and enrich the present now? That's what I'm gonna drop into and dive into and let it be okay. So so it's jars. <laughs> <laughs> it's jars. It's jars. So. And I think too, when we pull in the sutras and these different topics, what it does is it provokes a new way of saying things, right? Like a new way of knowing things. So an example as, uh, as clear as it is, and I'd have to find the exact, but basically there's a sutra that talks about the obstacles of yoga, for example. And it lists out, these are the obstacles of yoga. These are the things that, and when you read it, it's like, well, these are the things that separate us from our bodies. And it's so clear. So it's saying this is what separates us from our bodies. And then I can start to reflect and go, where has that separated me from my yoga, from my body, from my coherence? And then it, new insight can be provoked. So can you give an example? Because as you're speaking of this, I love, I love that we're like, okay, how like separation, right? Ways that we are separated. I'd be super curious to know some of his because I'm not very familiar with this sutra. 
Okay, so an example of this would be carelessness, right? Like carelessness can be an obstacle to our practice or to our bodies, right? Or the relationship with our bodies. And the reason I'm using this as an example is by having meaning around why I do what I do, why I, in context to what we're doing in the practice, that meaning erupts conscious intention in how to be in, be in the process and engage with my yoga. Whereas if I'm just like, oh yeah, you know, like my yoga pants and I go to yoga class, I don't know, like my yoga, but why? Like that, it, it prevents, it's proactive, it prevents me from falling into carelessness or even talking about, um, the like laziness can be an obstacle disease mental lethargy or you know mental exhaustion those types of things can be an obstacle and what i love though is patanjali talks about um or i think it's the commentator actually he talks about the example of that if we actually learn to use our obstacles in life the way a river does so what actually speeds up the current in a river is those rocks Mm -hmm. so we use those, again, this goes back to your duality stuff, right? We use it as contrast. So if I'm feeling doubt, right? Doubt is a uh, obstacle. If I'm feeling doubt, being curious about it. Well, why, what is this? How can I change my relationship to it? What is it teaching me? How do I renegotiate this? How do I have compassion with myself on it? And then that actually speeds up the current of growth. So yeah, the obstacles of yoga, it's interesting, you know, and then my other favorite is the four keys of peace. I like that you mentioned the whole, well, and I think what gets really interesting when we ask people, right, to, you talked about doubt, right? I'm feeling this. Well, then what is that getting curious about it? So one thing that I think a lot of people and even myself within a practice struggle with is, okay, well, I can recognize that I'm doubtful. I can recognize that I'm having, right, even during a practice, I can recognize that I'm uncomfortable, that I'm having like anxiousness in this posture. So we can understand, we can call it by its name, but where the shift happens is, okay, but what is that teaching me? And I think that is where a lot of us, we have trouble switching over into that, where we're taught a lot of times, acknowledge how you're feeling, which is great, but then where do you go from there, right? And so how do we get to that next point of making meaning out of it or finding the lesson? This is, I think, where yoga and meditation help us train the witnesser mind, the welcoming presence, right? Because when we see, oh, I have doubt, that next step you're talking about it's got to be practiced and trained to understand how to witness it and then do something with it. When we Mm -hmm. over identify with it, we can't see ourselves from separate from it. We end up absorbing the identity. So we go, I am doubtful. This is my reality. And we don't know how to feel ourselves beyond that. So this is again, what you're talking about is the realization and benefit that these practices have where it trains the neural plasticity and the neural patterns in our brain to be able to witness and not become, and we can see it, and then we can renegotiate it. So I I almost think there's a mental privilege thing here that exists first, that we got to work with the neurobiology, go through the body, because I can tell you to be aware and curious, but it's it's hard when you're hyper-aroused all the time, right? Because we immediately (laughs) adopt and identify and associate. Whereas when we practice and train inquiry, we're able to start to do that. And this is, you know, I'm just going to say, I think self-awareness is one of the most under-acknowledged liberations. Like, it's one of the most amazing things to have is self-awareness. Because when we have self-awareness and we go, oh, I, I navigate doubt. Oh, I navigate, you know, avoidance or whatever the thing is. When we, we are aware of that, then it gives us options. Because we go, what am I going to do with that? And that's freedom. And you know what? If you decide you're like, you know what? I No, I'm going to stay in avoidance. That's fine. But are you aware? Are you conscious, right? And then you can decide later if you want to change your mind about that. But freedom comes from the options that are a byproduct of self-awareness, which, I mean, it's what keeps me coming back to the practice. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what yoga trains us for, 
right? And when you're on your mat and when you're having the conversations with yourself and when you're able to pick up on the body's cues and you're able to pick up on what you're feeling and you're able to sit with it, right? Long enough because I mean, when you're in a yoga practice, most of the time you don't really have the option to just move on to the next. I mean, you can, (laughs) but it's that dedicated time and space to really sit with yourself. I'd be curious. It's that the meeting yourself for the first time. Like what if every time we got on the mat, we meet ourselves for the first time, you know, I don't know. Because we're so many different versions though, let's be honest. And if we really let ourselves be as we are in the moment, we are so dynamic of humans, you know? And I think that's art. Oh, it's beauty. I think that's, and it's so sad because you watch, you watch us get washed out of that, right? You watch us try to fit ourselves into, I always say I'm like, we're all, we're all just trying to like fit ourselves into like an Instagram bio or a Facebook bio. And I'm like, but you are so much more right than those three keywords. Don't care. You are so much bigger than that. And it gets so hard because we, right, we find value in what we define ourselves as. We find value in our roles, but it can also be very limiting, right? We can limit ourselves by the tendency or the need, right, to put ourselves into these little little boxes. You know, a, a little mantra. I'm careful to even say this. There's something in me that's like, maybe don't say this, but I feel like I want to say this. Is I really would, I so as a yoga teacher, right, or a mentor, et cetera, I always come to myself, though, and I say, I'm an artist, not a guru. I'm an artist, not a role model. I'm an artist, like, and I can model things or I can share things, but it's the way I create in my own life. And what you do with that, you get to do with what that however you want. But kind of widening the definition of how I even see myself has actually created so much permission to be honest in what I do. So I love that. So we're, love we're just artists. We're not yoga we're teachers. Just artists. We're artists. But we all are. I, I say it all the time. I'm like everything is just art, right? Mm-hmm. Some of it's ugly, some of it's absolutely beautiful, some of it is sorrowful, but everything is art. That's like when you view life through that lens, then we truly are. We're all artists then. If everything around us is art, we're all just here creating. And that truly, right, it widens the scape. And I I don't think, you know, if you're listening, you're like, yeah, I'm not an artist. It doesn't have to be, right, the understanding that you pick up, right, a paintbrush or you write a song it's you just you're creating we're constantly in a state of creation you know what helped me break that though to my own limitations and beliefs because you know I'm somebody who I think I'm great at singing but everybody tells me I'm not but I think (laughs) I sound great um I like to draw but you know school told me I wasn't great at it or I had bad grades on my writing and I think I you know I love to write so like the world will tell us different things but if we do it for the sake of doing it like we do art for the sake of art we do you know we create or we do our practice for the sake of our practice and not for these end results right and this is something yoga teaches us then we can be really true to that nature within us and this is you know going back to knowing our nature like our nature gets to talk so then we can see ourselves beyond and in that wider canvas that you're talking about you know i love that you speak to like um it widening or right you it allows us when we are like it doesn't matter why I'm doing it the outcome doesn't matter it's it's purely for the sake of doing it and I think that's where right the true art our true artist artistry is really born um it's not in and it took me a really long time to realize that I mean I love right all forms of art I'm I writing right pottery all these things but it stopped me for such a long time because it was so attached to the outcome um and again that's pressure and that it could be like that for anything though like that thing you want to create 
the book you want to write, the, even like something as simple as the conversation that you'd like to have with somebody, because that's art. Communication is art, right? But we get so tied to what does it look like at the end? We don't actually put in our full, right, heart and soul into just the process of doing it. Yeah. And yoga does teach that, right? Yoga does teach that. I love that. What is something that you love to do just for the sake of doing it? I love to read for the sake of reading. And when I tell you like read, I don't mean the sutras. I mean like a good book that means nothing, that is giving me zero educational value. It's it's not doing anything. Like I just love to be immersed in like the journey of reading a really juicy book. I love that. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, but again, it's been permission because for such a long time, I was so like, what am I gaining from reading this? Mm. Right. There's nothing. And I think this is a perfect example, right. Of just letting yourself do something for the joy and sake of doing it because being in school, being, you know, in YTT and then teaching, right. It gets very like, I'm like, what am I doing? Is this bettering me in any way? What is the outcome? What have I learned? What have I gained? And it's why I, I would not read anything for such a long time where I was like, it's, there's no value in it. And now, especially like over, I mean, I'll share, I've just, I've finished like five really long books over the span of four months. And they're like, these, like, uh, if you're familiar with like Sarah J Mass, like it's, it's just like fairy romantic fantasy books that it's like, I'm not really gaining much out of it, but my God, just to sit and let myself truly enjoy something has been huge. The thing is, is you do gain out of it. You gain quality right. of life. But you we don't think meaning. about it that way. Totally. And it's time we do. Like, it's time that, you know, we allow ourselves to drink these things up because it's that's where you're filling yourself up for that potential energy. And then when you make choices in your life, you're going further with that kinesthetic choice because we filled ourselves up because we do we live in our nature and we allow that to come up so yeah this is so good and I hope that this was there's I know we went all over the place today but so many different places for y'all to drop in and get curious and deepen in and before we close I don't know if there's anything else Avery you want to share no, go do something just for the sake of it feeling good, I guess. Even Full if, permission. Yes. I, I turned my saxophone back in, so if anybody wanted to know, I left. <laughs> I brought it back. We returned it. It's totally, I mean, I was renting it, but you know, I did it for the sake of doing it. It felt good. And then I felt done. It makes me think of like mudras. So when you do a mudra in a meditation or a practice, the, the mudra will tell you it's done with you because your hands will let go. Like it'll just let your hands will. And I feel like that it's a metaphor in a way for a lot of things. You'll know, like do it for the sake of doing it. And then you'll just know, okay, that was good. And now on to the next. So well, I'm glad that you had that experience and that your body told you you were done with saxophone. I definitely am not done with juicy books, but I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Mm. And thank you all for listening. I hope this was something that inspired Nourish and go make your reminder jars, your yoga sutra jars, whatever that be. May you find a lot of creativity in the week to come. Thank Talk you. Talk to you guys soon.